Hi there once again and welcome to another Expresso Mechanic tutorial. And in this one we're going to be making a winch and bucket. In order to do this we're going to be using a combination of Expresso and Dynamics and we'll also use a couple of deformers in order to make the rope work correctly. The bucket is the dynamic object. Anyway, without further ado, let's see if we can make this happen. The workflow for this is quite important, so I'm going to start from scratch and show you the whole thing. First thing I'm going to do is change to a side view, so I'm going to hit F3 and we'll get a hold of the spline pen tool. I've got my snapping already set up, so that's enabled and I've got grid stroke work plane snap selected, which is what I'm going to use here. So the first point I'm going to put at zero 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 and I'm going to just click there to put my second point in. I'll select that one and it needs to be at minus 600 not minus 500 so we want a length of rope that's 600 centimeters in length. Next thing I'm going to do is get a circle and I'm going to orientate this in the XY and then change its radius to 0.6 Moving on from here, I can drop both the spline and the circle into a sweep. So we'll get one of those, hold down Alt and drop the circle in and then just add the spline. Go back into my 3D view and we can see that we've got a length of rope. And if we just do a quick zoom in, we can see that it's orientated correctly. So the circle is set up correctly in the sweep. That's great. Moving on from this section, we're going to grab a hold of the sweep and I'm going to hold down my Alt key and press G to group it. And I'm going to call this cable. And I'm going to do the same thing again and rename this null cable angle. And I'm going to do the same thing again and rename this one cable position. And I'm going to do it one more time. So Alt G and name this winch. Twirl those open. And that is the basic setup for our hierarchy there. As the tutorial progresses, you'll see why I've set this up the way I have. So don't worry about it too much for the moment. All become clear. It's worth noting that all of the axes for each of these nulls and also the spline are at point zero. That's the place they need to be in order to get this to work as we want it to. So make sure when you start making this yourself, you always start with the first point of your spline at point zero. That will place the axes of the spline there and then everything else that you put there, if you do it the way I've done it, will be at that point. So that's worth noting. Moving on from here, we need to do a little bit of work with the spline because at the moment it's the wrong type. So I can leave it at Bezier. That's not too bad. We can leave it like that. But instead of being an adaptive, I'm going to make it a uniform spline and give it a number of 300 to give it the correct subdivisions. If we just move in a little closer, we can take a look at what we've got. If we switch to Garrard lines, you can see the division there. So we're going to get a nice set of divisions or a nice spacing between our divisions, I suppose I should say, in order to make this work as a piece of rope. So how are we going to make this work as a piece of rope? Well, that's the next question and that's where we're coming to now. First thing we're going to do is grab a bend deformer. I'm also going to change my display to ice palms so that we don't get quite as much detail in that rope there. Now this bend deformer I'm going to place initially under the spline and then I'm going to hit if we just move over a little bit, fit to parent. I'm going to just do that. And if we then look at the object, we can see that we've got it the perfect size uh, in order to affect our whole rope. And that's what we've got to do in order to make this work. Moving on from here, we can put the bend deformer in its correct place in the hierarchy, which is actually under the cable angle null. 
that's where it needs to be in the hierarchy in order for this to work. It's also at the wrong position. It says it currently resides at minus two or 299.997. It's minus 300 technically, isn't it? But we just need that at 300. So we'll put it up there and now it's in the correct place to actually deform our rope in the correct way. Just zoom in again so that we can see exactly where we are and we can see what's going on. OK, let's get this thing set up. The alignment and the mode we can leave alone because they're both already as they need to be. So let's look at the strength, the angle and keep length. Well, for a start, we can check keep length because that's what we want to do. The strength I'm going to set to 7000 degrees, a large number, but it's important. So 7000 degrees and I'm going to set the angle to 180, which will make our rope bend in the correct direction. So let's just try this. So if we select the cable, let's just see what happens when we start moving this thing. And straight away, you can see that it is deforming in the way that we'd like it to deform. It's actually doing what we want it to. It's going to behave like a piece of rope. Now, the actual divisions in it, we could increase those if we wished. There's not really an awful lot that we can do in the sweep. Um, we, you know, isopalm subdivision, I suppose we can try increasing that a little bit. Uh, let's just try 100 and see if that makes any difference. It does make a difference, but let's see if it makes things work the way we'd like it to. If it doesn't, and it doesn't really, does it? Because the isopalm subdivision is actually around the circumference of the rope object. It's not really affecting anything else about it. So let's just go into there and just put that back as 10. We'll leave it as it is. We'll go into the spline again and we'll increase the subdivisions here. Let's just go for 600 and see if we get a better result. Yeah, and that's I think that's acceptable. That will work because we're not going to be zooming really close into this. Yeah, that will work fine. I think 600 is fine. But that's something to remember. You know, make sure you get your subdivisions in your rope set up nicely so that you get the deformation. I mean, if you want super detail, then increase this number even more. Uh, you know, it's entirely up to you to art direct this uh, however you choose. But that about completes this little section. So we can move on from here and look at where we're going next. Currently, our rope is moving in a nice circle through our bend deformer, but it's not creating coils. And that's the next thing we need to do here. We've got to make it do that. How are we going to do that? Well, the simple thing to do is to select the bend deformer and in our rotation section here, we can just say one degree in the H and I'm going to set minus two as an initial number in the rotation P. Straight away, the bend deformer moves quite a long way because, of course, its axes are 300 centimeters above it. So that's why it's moved quite a long way there. Let's just zoom out a little bit so that we can see what's going on. If we get our cable now and start moving it, let's see what happens. Ah, and straight away, we're starting to get something that resembles a coil of rope. Now, if we look down here, if we just zoom in a little bit, we can see that we need to do a little bit of adjustment because at the moment the rope's going through itself. So let's get a hold of the bend deformer again. And in, in the rotation P here, that's the one that we're going to need to adjust. Let's try 2.1, not quite enough. 2.2, yeah. Now 2.2, that looks a pretty much, yeah, I mean, it's it's there's still a tiny, tiny little bit of discrepancy in there. And if you want to be really pedantic about it, you can say go 2.23 or something like that, or 2.22 and, and see if that works. But for my purposes here, I'm going to leave it at 2.2. I think that will be perfectly acceptable uh, and that should work quite nicely. Now, if I get the cable, and I've at the moment it's position Y is 58.413, but we know that the, the cable is actually 600 in length. So if we say 600 in there, now we can look at what we've got and we can see that we've got a complete coil of rope. And that looks quite nice. But if we go into our side view and we say object, let's just go a little bit closer, in actual fact, just zoom right into it you can see that we've got a bit of an issue. 
we've got a bit of a problem. It's at a funny angle. And if we look down on top of it and we zoom in this way, you can also see that there's another issue there as well. It's more subtle in the top view than it is in the side view. But in both those views, you can see that the angle isn't correct. So we've got to do some work on those and get that right next. Fortunately, this is quite easy to fix and you'll see now why I've got the cable angle null. So in my rotation H, I'm simply going to put minus one because I put one degree in there for the bend deformer. So minus one and straight away that's corrected the problem if we look at when we're looking down upon the cable there. That's that's already sorted that one out. If we go into the side view, this is where it's more dramatic. And what we'll do here, I'm going to put 1.9 in there and we'll see if that's sorted it. And it has. 1.9 is absolutely fine for that. It's completely solved the problem. So that's the first part of this sorted out. But there's still more issues that we've got to deal with. And uh, we'll just undo the cable or, or work with our cable here and take it away from the 600. If we say 500. Now let's have a look at that in the side view. And again, you can see where there's another problem. Because the cable is actually pointing at an angle that is clearly not correct because it should effectively be in line with this this grid line here. That's where it should be pointing. So we've still got another thing that we need to fix. And how are we going to do that? Well, the way we're going to do that is to bring in a shear deformer. So I'll get a hold of one of those. I'm going to initialize the shear deformer with its correct sizes and I'm also going to set it up in the rotation here as well. So in the rotation I'm going to do that first actually. Um, in fact let's just say object so that we can see what we're doing. Now at the top if you, can, you, if you look at the shear deformer you can see that we've got this arrow here which is as in the new release of Cinema 4D or release 26 they've, they've put this arrow in and it shows you the direction in which the shear deformer is actually going to be shearing. And all the other deformers have got these these arrows in them as well, which is a great feature because it's really helpful. In order to get this pointing in the right direction, we need that arrow to be pointing in the along the along the z-axis, but it needs to be in the minus direction. That's what we've got to do. So in here we'll say 90 degrees, and then we'll turn it through 180 in our rotation B. And now our arrow is pointing in the correct direction. So the shearing is going to be working properly. Moving on from here, let's change the size of the shear deformer. So rather than 250, we can say we want it 25 in the X. We'll also make it 10 in the Y and we'll make it 5 in the Z. Zoom in on the object and we've got it in the correct in the correct plane and we're also at the correct size we're just going to move it over here and I'm also going to move it down to somewhere around there it also needs to be placed under the bend deformer so we'll put that into in place now and then we can think about how we're going to set this thing up the alignment can stay as it is the mode will switch from limited to unlimited. And now we'll look at strength and the angle. But before I do that, I'm going to switch to a side view so that we can see exactly what's going to go on here. I'll zoom in a little bit closer, I think, just so that we uh, we can see what's going to happen to the coil of, of rope. If we leave it about there. That should be OK. The strength I'm going to set to 2.5 initially. Now there's Obviously something's happened and it's quite dramatic. Now the reason for that is because curvature is being used. Let's just take that away. We don't want any curvature. Now the angle is also important here. Let's just see what we've got. Now it looks at first glance as if this is pretty good. In fact, it could almost be right, but the angle isn't quite correct. So if we just switch to our top view, we can see what's going on in there. 
what I need to do is just go closer in. I just want to see now this this is the end of the rope here looking down upon it and you can see that the the rope is not quite in the right place so the angle isn't 100 percent correct yet so what we're going to do if we set that angle to let's just try a couple of degrees at first it's not enough try five degrees that's 52 I don't want that much five degrees right that's it's that's actually pushed it into alignment it's more parallel now, but there's still a slight issue with the, the Z. So what we've done there, we've actually sort of twisted the rope along the, it's almost like along the Y axis so that, that that's caused that to, to move. If we look at what we've got here, so you, you can see that the, the actual arrow along the, the line of the shear there isn't directly aligned with the rotation Z anymore. So it's pushing it along the rot along the rotation Z and it's, it's twisted it into the correct sort of plane there. But we still need a bit more strength so let's try 2.6 now we're close there now aren't we and not quite so let's just 2.65 maybe yeah 2.65 is more or less dead on the dot so that's good and we'll leave that like that so let's go back into our side view and we can see from the side view that we're still nicely in in line and everything is is as it should be uh, and if we just take a look at the whole thing just zoom out and have a quick look we can see that that is now looking very very nice indeed it's looking exactly as we'd like it to be if we go back into 3d view again everything is looking very very good let's just look at the end view here uh, just to make sure that everything is aligned as it should be there uh, because that will show us a little bit more detail let's have a look and yeah it, it all looks good there's no doesn't appear to be any real distortion there that looks it all looks as if it's working very very nicely so yeah I'm I'm pretty happy with that and I think we can say that we've got our coil of rope pretty much behaving the way that we want it to behave so that's the first hurdle that we really needed to get over because the coil of rope it's got to be absolutely right in order for, for this to actually sort of sell itself as a as a piece of animation if there's any sort of errors in this it, it just won't work properly but that looks really nice so let's get a hold of our cable move back up to 600 and yep that all looks nice yeah looking really great well, let's take it back to zero well, actually I'll leave it there for now because the next thing I've got to do is bring in a cylinder which is going to act as a capstan which the rope will be coiling around. That's our next port of call. Let's just orientate this correctly so we can say plus Z. Bring it down to a much smaller radius. We'll get this sorted out in a moment and then about 25 in the length should be I think okay I mean I'm not going to do any real modeling with this until well pretty much the end of the tutorial really um, but it's, this is just to get this in position and then we'll start working with Espresso uh, to get things working let's just go into the end view just see where we are and we're just going to sort of eye this through for now and just get it into the correct position just drop it down a little bit and then just bring the radius down it wants to be probably about 4.8 maybe a bit less 4.7 possibly even a bit less than that 4.5 try that so we would also take that snap off I don't want that anymore it's causing more problems than it's solving let's have a look that's not too bad in terms of its position it's might be around 4.3 somewhere around there for the diet the actual radius there yeah I'm thinking that's good It'll work, uh, and I'm in the height segments. I'm just going to say um, just two height segments and 30 in the rotation segments. I'm leaving it like that. So yeah, I'm happy. I think with that, it's looking pretty darn good. Yeah, that's that's acceptable. That's good. Yeah, 
Yeah, that'll do nicely. That'll do the job for us. The next thing to do is to actually use this as a controller for the, the rope, because of course, in real life, you would move this and the rope would be coiled around it. So that's what we've got to do. And we're going to use Espresso in order to make that happen. But before we get into that, the first thing we need to do, I'm just going to switch to a side or rather the end view, switch to my end view. First thing I'm going to do is get an arc and I'm going to group this into the winch or rather I'm going to group it into the cylinder and zero it out. And I'm going to reduce its radius to about six, which is fine. And change the type to a segment and the immediate intermediate points to adaptive. That gives us a perfect segment then. And I'm going to use this to actually work out how much we are missing of if we, if we just go back to the 3D view, you can see that if we move this, the end of the rope is at point zero, but the other end of the rope isn't. So we've got literally a segment of this coil missing and we need to find out how big it is. And that's what I'm going to use the arc to do. So if we just go into the end view again, what I'm going to do here is, is set my start and end angles. So let's see what we can do with the start angle. So if we bring that round until it lines up with the end of the rope there, I'm just going to put 157.5 there because that's where it needs to be. That's pretty darn good. And then the start angle, well, it's got to be 180 degrees or possibly minus 180 degrees, I think. Yeah, because that lines up with the crosshairs that we've got in the cylinder here. So if we just forget the minus sign there. So if we add 180 to 157.5, get the calculator. So if we say 180 plus 157.5, we get 337.5 degrees. So if we say 360, minus 337.5, we get 22.5 degrees. Now that's 1 16th of a circle. So this is a 16th of one coil. That's what's missing. We could do with expressing that as a percentage. Now let's just see if we can work out what that should be. If I say 300, no, 20, leave it at 22.5, 22.5 divided by 360 and then times that by 100. So it's 6.25%. That is to say that this part is 6.25%, but what we really, what we're really interested in is what the rest is. So obviously that's going to be 100 minus 6.25 which is 93.75. So we've got 18, effectively 18 coils, 18 plus 93.75. So 18.9375 coils, that's what we've got. So we can use that number in order to help us with our rotation and making our cylinder here synchronize with our rope. So what we're going to do then is get the calculator out again and we'll say 600 divided by 18.9375 or 18.93 actually is fine. That's absolutely fine. And we get 31.695. Now 31.695 is a useful number to us, but it's not the exact number. I happen to know this won't work 100%, but it's a good starting point. Bearing that number in mind, we'll leave the calculator there. And what we'll do is get a null. We'll call it Espresso. And we'll give it a 
programming or come down to programming and give it an espresso tag. We've got the window open and now we can start work. I'll drag in the cylinder. In fact, I'll get rid of the arc first, drag in the cylinder. The arc served its purpose, so we don't need that anymore. What we're interested in with the cylinder is going to be its rotation B. So let's come down to coordinates, rotation, rotation B, and set that up in there. The next node I need will be a degree node. I'll plumb the output of my cylinder's rotation B into the input of the degree node. The function can stay as it is. That's exactly what I need it to be. And then we'll get a hold of our favorite node or one of my favorite nodes, <laughs> the range mapper, our old friend. We're going to be using that one as well. So we'll plumb that in there. In the upper or the input upper here, I'm going to say 360 for 360 degrees. And the output, coming back to my calculator, it's 31.695. We could say 31.7 as a round number. That would be a good starting point. So if we say 31.7, that will go in there. And that gets us a start. And then all we've got to do is drag in our cable null and literally say coordinates, position, position, Y. And plug that into there. Straight away it changes because our, our cable is now set up as a zero position, which is where it should be. And our cylinder, its rotation B is zero. So the two are synchronized. Let's just see where we are here. Right, so you can see that the cable is just above the center line of the cylinder. Let's do a few rotations here and see what happens and see if there's slippage. And I, well, I know there's going to be actually, but let's just see how much there's going to be. So if we start to move this straight away, we've got a problem because we should have put minus in the range mapper. So what I should do here, instead of saying 360, is put minus 360. So that's sorted that one out. It's working now, that's good. Well, you can see that there is slippage. There's slippage immediately, isn't there? Quite noticeable slippage. Now, this happens, I think, because although we've said in the bend deformer that we wanted to keep length, We've also used the shear deformer and there is no option to sort of keep the length of, of uh, a spline with that. So that's caused distortion as well. And I think that's probably where the maths is a little bit off uh, with this. And, and it's very difficult to calculate it uh, absolutely correctly. I've never found a way of doing that. I mean, if there's some bright spark out there who does know a way to do it, um, then again, as I always say, please get in touch. I'm all ears. I like to learn too. But what you can do actually to sort this out, it's not really that difficult to do. Uh, there's a little bit of trial and error that creeps into this, but it's not a humongous amount and it's not all that difficult to do. So coming back into the Expresso and into the range mapper here, what you need to do is adjust this, this number, this output upper here. Now, let's just take it a little bit downwards. So we'll just see what happens. What we'll do in order to actually illustrate this. I've, I've taken 0.2 off of it, but let's just get a hold of the cylinder. And if we rotate this a few times so that we've got a degree of slippage in there, let's just see what we get when we start playing around in the range mapper here. So if we come down to 0.3, straight away, you can see that you you, you take quite a bit of it off by, by taking the numbers down just, just a fraction, really. 31.1 um, is very close. So let's go down to 31 and see how close we are with that. And then take the rotation B of the cylinder back to zero and have another quick go at it. Let's just do this. Well, it, again, there's still noticeable slippage over one revolution. It's not a huge amount, though, not as much as it was before. So let's try going a little bit lower. Let's go to 30.9. And we've taken it down again and we'll take our yeah, back to the beginning. And, and, and that's 
not as noticeable as it was before, not by a long way. Let's have a go again. Yeah, it's, st it's still pretty good. Let's just take it round a couple more times and see what we get. So it still looks pretty good, doesn't it? It's not 100%. I mean, if we were to go, let's go minus, let's do more or less all the terms. So I know that that's 6840. Let's do that. Yeah, and we've got quite noticeable slippage over that amount of, or about a, over that number of turns. So let's just take this down some more. So if we go 0.8, what do we get then? No, it's gone the other way. So 0.8 is too much. So let's say 0.85, and it's still below 0.87, just above. So let's try 0.85 and split the difference between 0.8 and 0.9. Right, now that's very close to what we had before. Um, and that looks as if it might be the sort of magic number that will make this work. So let's let's just see. I'll tell you what, in fact, what we'll do, just set that to 4.0. So that's there. And then we'll go from there back to zero and let's see what we get. Well, that's almost perfect. It hardly notices. It hardly notices. And Let's just do one revolution there. And you can see that that's it is not noticeable now. So that's what you've got to do. And as I say, I think it's because we've got the distortion caused by the the deformer here. You see, it's not absolutely a perfect science. This it's it's something you're going to have to do a little bit of tweaking with. You, you can get it close enough and then just do a bit of tweaking in order to get it to work as you want it to. Um, but it, it doesn't take long. I mean, that's less than five minutes work. So, you know, it's not exactly going to take you forever. Um, but do bear in mind that you will have to do that with this unless you know a magic formula. Uh, I don't. Um, so it's a case of just having to do a little bit of adjustment after the event. But anyway, that's got it that far. Of course, the next thing we need to worry about, if we just put that back to 6840 with a minus sign in front, the next thing we're going to need to do is worry about moving the coils to the correct position because obviously when this is when this winds the rope actually needs to move along the z axis it can't move in this direction that's the wrong way so it needs to move this way okay so that's something that we need to worry about next and we'll we'll set that up and get that working another thing we need to do of course is move the cylinder because the cylinder needs to actually be in the positive Z direction, not the negative as it is at the moment. So let's just get that set up. If we just move it over to somewhere there for now and we go to our side view, we can just see where we are. If we just move it back to about there. And then we'll get the espresso going again and we'll make this start position of the rope move along as the rope coils so that it moves in the correct fashion along the cylinder there. Right, so the first thing to do is wind the rope on. So we'll say minus 6840 so that we get everything wound on. Now we know that we've got to move our cable position and that's what we've, that's why that's in there. So if we get a hold of this, just go to view side view there and zoom out a little bit so that we can see everything and we'll move this along until it's just about there I think should be fine so just go into the top view what I want to do is actually look at that coil of rope that last coil of rope right I need to get that the, the, the center of this circle needs to be right on the crosshairs here. So if I move that purely along the z-axis, I should be able to line that up perfectly well. And it's going to be somewhere there. That should be perfectly good. That distance is 22.488. So what we can say, we'll get another range mapper and we'll plumb the output of our degree node into there and if we put 22 now it's obviously going to be minus 6840 and 
point four double eight in there. And then we can simply say that we want our start or our cable position dragged into here. And we want to work with position Z. And if we plumb that in there, it should stay where it is and it does. And then if we get our cylinder, we should now see, in fact, all I'll do, I'll put it back at zero so we can make sure that we're OK. So we're at the zero point, so it should be working fine. So if we move this now, you can see that everything's starting to move and we're getting what we would expect in real life. And that looks superb. Fantastic. If we just go into the, the side view, we'll just make sure that we're getting everything in there looking OK. Yeah, you can see it looks really nice. The rope is moving exactly as we think we'd like it to. We can double check by using the top view. If we just move down to the end. And we can see, I mean, that's looking good. It's, it, it's, it's looking as if it's all working very nicely. Let's just keep it moving. Yeah, that's looking good. That's looking good. Yeah, I don't think there's any complaints there. That's, that's all nice. That's, that's, it might not be 100% accurate, but it's certainly close enough. I mean, you're not going to notice that. Yeah, that looks good, doesn't it? That's looking nice. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with what we've got there. So we'll wind it through, just keep it going. Yeah, I mean, we can go a little beyond 6840. It doesn't have to be our finished position. I mean, we the way this is set up, we can keep going as far as we like. But what we'll probably do, and what I did with my original model, I went to somewhere about sort of there. And, I, and that was where I sort of had the hook on the end of it with the bucket. So, yeah, I mean, somewhere about there, or I think that's too far, really. So that, well, I don't know, it could, that could be OK. It could work. Um, we could say something like 6,900. That that would work. 6,900 minus 6,900 would be a good finishing point for, for our winch there. I think that'll work OK. But that's great. So that's the formula for doing that particular part of it you just get another range mapper work out how far your coil of rope needs to travel put that in the output upper and then in the input upper the angle of rotation for your cylinder and you've got it sorted so moving on from here we now need to add a hook to the end of our rope and that's what we're going to do next just change to my end view so function four and then we'll start taking a look at how we're going to do this. So let's get the pen tool, or the spline pen, and start roughing out the points for this hook. Come down to about there, I think. Put one here. Another one about there, and then one around there. And then just to finish it off, we'll put one here and one about there. And that's OK for a, a sort of rough. It's not perfect, so we can do some adjustments on it. If we just take these two, just move those slightly over there. And then what I'll do is with the rectangle selection, I'll just select all of these points. And in my spline, I'll come down to tangents and say soft interpolation. So that's looking good. And then we can just make some manual adjustments to these, just manipulate them into better positions so that they form a shape that does resemble a hook. It's a little bit wide, so let's just select all of these points and get the scale tool. Just bring them in a tad. I think that's pretty good. It's looking quite nice, actually. So let's just again move these down somewhere there yeah I mean that's not a bad shape it's not a bad shape for a hook is it that, that will 
work quite nicely I mean if needs be we can just in fact I'll select both of these points and, and just bring them down just a little bit and yeah I think that'll do nicely that's a good profile for a hook so moving on from here what I'm going to do is going to spline axis axis center and we want the Y at 100% and just hit um, not reset I just want to hit ex execute and then that should be fine if I go back into model mode here and we can see that we've got the axis here at the top of the spline not perfectly aligned with the first point of it that's not a problem it's it's where it needs to be so that's fine moving on from here we'll get a circle and we'll make its radius 0.8 so slightly just slightly bigger than our radius for our rope and then with the spline selected what I'm going to do is hold down my alt key and throw this into a sweep and now the sweep is in exactly the same position as the axis or the, the sweeps axis are in the same position as that of the spline which is great that's exactly what I need and then I can throw the circle under the sweep now obviously the scale at the moment is a bit out so we'll come down into the details here and start manipulating that here so I'm just going to bring this point down to around there and this one can go quite low that can go sort of there and what we'll do is hold down command and add another point and have a little play around with this see what we can do something like that looks pretty reasonable just go up a little bit there just move it over yeah I mean that's looking quite nice I th that will probably work actually as a hook it's not too bad so we'll just rename this hook and I'm also going to group that into a null and call that hook assembly move it down to the bottom of the object manager there and then I can just roughly put this in position at the end of the rope there let's go to our side view yeah that's fine okay so that's the hook made the next port of call is to get another espresso tag on this hook assembly here and then we'll start doing the necessary work to get the hook to root itself or to attach itself I suppose I should say to the end of the cable as the cable moves up and down and across the length of our cylinder that's our next port of call the first thing I'm going to do is bring my hook assembly into the espresso editor and at the input stage I'm going to say coordinates position position X position Y and position Z and we'll leave this on the right hand side as it's the last part of the chain the next thing to do is bring in the spline from the cable and give that an object port we then need a point node and we can plumb the output of the spline into the object input there of the point node and the point index is the first thing that we're interested in here and we know that our cable only has points at the beginning and the end so it's the end point that we're interested in and that has a point index value of one moving on from here I need an adapter node and it will be a vector to reels the point position can be plumbed into the input there and the position Y or the output Y into the position Y on the hook assembly I'll also move the Z position Z just up there just to tidy things up a little bit okay that's looking good and if we just get a hold of the cylinder 
and move it, you'll now see that the hook will move as it should in the Y axis. But we've got to sort out the other two. So how do we go about doing this? Well, for a start, we can bring in the cable position. That will play a key role in making this happen. Unfortunately, we can't just plug these two into the other two there. It, it won't do the job for us. But the cable position, we can get a go, come down to coordinates, global position, global position X, and coordinates, global position Z. We'll then get a math node as a starting point for this and see what happens. Now the math, I'm just going to simply plumb the position Z into there for now. And then my position or global position X, I can plug directly into the position X of the hook assembly. And then this can plug into the position Z. And let's just take a quick look at what's going on in our side view. And you can see that we've got a bit of an issue in the, the Z axis here because it is skewed over to one side. We don't want that. We want to center it up. And that's what we're about with this. So can we do anything with the addition node to help ourselves out of this? Well, we can try adding a small amount. Let's try point 0.1. And straight away, point 0.1 appears to have solved the problem. However, if we go back into our 3D view and then we rotate our cylinder back to zero and then take a look at what's happening with the, the assembly down there with the assembly. Again, you can see that that problem is still there. So on its own, the addition node, it doesn't solve the problem. It only goes some of the way to solving the problem just when it's at the end. So we've got to do a little bit more work here. What we've got to do is use another range mapper actually to sort this out. So what we'll do, we'll move this over here, and come down to calculate range mapper and bring one of those in. And then I can plug the output from my Z into the input of the range mapper and the output into the top input of the math there. So what are we going to add the input or the second? What's going to come into the second input? Well, we're going to add the Z position from here into the second input. Now, straight away, that hook has moved by a long, long way. But that's fine. That's not a problem. We're going to sort that out right now with the range mapper. So what can we say about, firstly, our cable position? Well, it's it's currently on its position Z. It's at, it's at its zero point. Now, we also know that if we move our cylinder back through minus 6840, and then select our cable position, it's then at its final destination. So it's at 22.488. So in our range mapper, we can say that our input lower is zero and our input upper is going to be 22.488. That takes care of our input stage and our driver is going to be doing its job. At the output stage, that's what we've got to play around with. So if we go and take a little look at what we've got going on with our cylinder and where our hook is. Now our hook, you can we can see, is, is definitely quite a long way out at the moment. So let's use the range mapper to sort out its final destination, which is going to be the output upper of the range mapper. Now currently that's set to one. Let's set it to zero and see what happens. So that's moved it back a little bit we probably, well, in fact, we're definitely going to be using a minus number because we've got to go further to the left. So if we say minus 0.1 and we see what we get there, well, it's moved it a little bit further. Let's try 0.3. Right, so we're incredibly close now. And if we say 0.35, we're dead on the dot. Now, obviously, I've done this before, so I knew that was going to be the right number. <laughs> but uh, that's the output or the, or the final destination. So that's the output upper sorted out. So minus 0.35 can go in there. We now need to do the output lower. So we'll get our cylinder, put it back at zero, select our hook assembly and take a look at what's going on. 
So the hook is currently residing a long way into space between the rope and itself. There's a, there's a fair distance between the two of them. In the range mapper, let's take a quick look at what we're going to do in here. So let's take this back by minus 10 and see if that does any good. Well, that's about half the distance, isn't it? So if we say minus 20, we're going to be a lot closer, but it's a little bit too far. So if we said minus 19.5, well, that's not quite far enough. So 19.6, almost there. If we just go into our side view and take a look. Yeah, we're almost there. Not quite there, but nearly. So let's go 19.7. And now we're dead on the money. That's exactly where it needs to be. All things being fair, if we select our cylinder and take a look at what we're doing with that. If we go into our top view and we look down at all of it, just zoom in a little bit so that we can see and get a bit of a clearer picture of what's going on. And we start winding our cylinder. And we can see now that that hook is in exactly the right position and it's staying there because the range mapper is dealing with the discrepancy. So yeah, that's working beautifully. So that's how you fix that little problem. You, you know, there will be discrepancies that creep into this, but you can tidy them up using range mappers and addition nodes. It's very simple. But yeah, that's working very, very beautifully now and doing exactly what we want it to do. And when the hook finally arrives, you can see, whoops, gone a bit too far, but you can see that it's in the correct position and it's been in the correct position all the way along the line. And that completes the Espresso part of our tutorial. We've got it all working, so we've got a nice winch, rope and hook all behaving exactly as they need to. Fantastic. Our next port of call is to build a bucket and turn this into a dynamic object which we can hang on our hook. So let's see what we can do. The first thing I'm going to bring in is a cone and just start working with its top radius, bottom radius and height and a few other settings. Now in the top radius, I'm going to give this a uh, four in there. The bottom radius, I'm going to say 2.5 and we'll give it a height of eight as a starting point. It might be a little too big. Let's just go to my side view and drop this down here. Let's try three in the top radius and maybe two in the bottom radius and just change the height to seven, maybe even six. Yeah, that will be, I think that'll be quite good. I think that'll work okay. Yeah, that'll be okay. It's, it's a reasonable size for a bucket. <laughs> now the height segments only want one and 30 rotation segments. I'm going to make it editable. I'm also going to get my knife tool and say KL and put a loop cut through these polygons. I'm also going to get my, just select these, just do a UL loop selection and I'll get my scale tool and just bring them a little bit closer to the edge. The next thing is to go into a side view, take a good look at the object and what I'll do, I'm going to hit D for extrude and extrude, we'll try minus 7.5, let's see if that's any good, it's probably going to be too far, try minus 5.5, not quite far enough so I'm just going to drop those down by hand and then once again select the scale tool and just bring those into there 
so that the, the sidewall of the bucket is actually simulated there. Good, so that's the first part of our bucket done. I'm now going to grab a, a cylinder, orientate this along the z-axis, much much too big so make it something like a mill uh, one centimeter uh, by maybe we'll try one by three and I'm going to group that into the cone and then zero it out so let's just go back into model mode there and put that down there It's still way too big. So let's make it much smaller. Let's go down to say 0.2 in the radius. Yeah, that would be about right, I think. And something like a centimetre. In fact, it's less. Let's go 0.6. And we'll go into our side view. <clears throat> and then we'll place this somewhere near the top of the bucket. Somewhere like that. That should be okay. I'm going to give this two height segments and we'll go 30 again for the rotation segments just for the sake of keeping things the same. And then I can make this editable, go into my edge selection, UL for loop selection and select this loop here. And I just want to bring that over to the left somewhere there. And then what I'll do is go into polygon mode, UL again for loop selection, select these, D for extrude, and then something like 0.1. And that again, that's fine. That would be enough to support the handle. That's exactly what we're trying to build here. The little lugs that support the handle. In the model mode, I'm gonna just copy this, command drag to copy. And then in the rotation H, just put 180 degrees in there and then move it by eye into position somewhere around there. Could go a little bit further. The same with the other one, they could just, just move that one a little bit further out there. They should be fine, just by eye is, is good for this. So we can call this cone bucket. And now what we need to do is think about building the handle for the bucket. So we'll start by going into our side view once again. Just zoom out a little way so that it gives us a clear picture of where we're going to need to position it. Get a cube, drop that into the bucket. Again, we'll zero it out make it much much smaller of course so we'll go down to we'll just do one by one by one and take it from there so we've got a cube down there and we can bring a, it up here and move it somewhere into position okay let's just zoom out a little bit in the z i think we can make this something like 0.2 maybe a bit more, maybe 0.3. Well, we should get away with that with a little bit of adjustment, shouldn't we? Yeah, we'll leave it at 0.3, um, probably about 0.8 by 0.8 in there. I think they, we'll get away with that, I think. I think we'll get away with that. In, in With the 0.3, let's go to 5. Yeah, that's fine. And then what we can do is copy that again. We'll just zoom out a little bit. Get a hold of it and copy once again and just by eye drop it somewhere there. So I've got two cubes. Just take these out. And I'm going to make them both editable. They're fine the way they are. They don't need anything adjusted, so they're fine. Go into my 3D view and get a little bit closer in fact what I'll do I'll select my end view if I go to lines we'll just see what we're doing
and I'll select polygons. With my selection tool, I'm going to turn off only visible elements and I'm going to select the four polygons I've got there. I'm then going to hit I for inner extrusion and go something like 0.2. Let's just have a quick check, see where we are. That's a yeah, that's not too bad. It could be 0.25 or rather 0.15. That's not quite far enough, so go 1.9. Yeah, I think that that's probably going to work fine for us. So in my 3D view, I'll just change to lines so that I can see exactly what I'm doing. And then I'll press MB for the bridge tool and select those two and those two. And that opens up the holes that I need between the two of those to make this look a little bit more realistic. And now I think the next thing to do is change back to only visibles in there. Select this and again, inner extrude, I'm going to go something like 0 0.05 just so that we get a little bit of inner extrusion on that one. And I'm also going to do the same over here. That's what an inner extrude, that one by 0.5. With this one still selected, I'm then going to go MX for matrix extrude. And I'm also going to change into my side view so that I can see exactly what's going to happen. So in the matrix extrude, I'm going to leave this. Well, actually, I'm going to change the steps to nine. Uh, we'll go as a rough number. We'll just go five in there. These will always all be 100 percent. And 10 degrees. Well, let's just see what happens. Right, it's not right, so how is it incorrect? Let's just see where we are. Right, it's going the opposite way to what we wanted to, and also 5 is way too big, so let's go 0.5. Yeah, that's getting closer to it. Now try minus 10. Let's have a look in the side view. Yeah, and that's that's good. I think we can actually have probably another, another one. And that's quite nice. Let's just take that back a tad to go 0.45. No, it's not enough, is it? I think 0.5 is better. Yeah, that's better. In fact, what I'll do, I'll go 0 0.6 and I will take this back to 9. Let's see where we are now. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I'm liking that. I, I think that's good. I think that's what we're looking for. That being the case, what I'll do is select my other cube go MX again and then just change this to 10 degrees and that gives us two two parts of our handle there and they're almost joining up in the middle they're just a you know fractionally away from each other which is great actually that's fine what I'll do is select both of the cubes go into mesh come down to conversion and say connect and delete so now we've got one object and now if I do MB for bridge and I select these two, I've joined them together. And that's fine. That's looking good. So we've got the handle for our bucket complete. At least in terms of its construction. Now at the moment it's a little bit like a a sort of blocky sort of thing, isn't it? So what we're going to do is drop it into a subdivision surface. And now if we go back to garage shading lines, we find that we've got something that's nice. We've got quite a nice smooth bucket handle there. What we can do just to make things a little bit tidier is just move this down a little bit so that it just makes it that little bit smoother. Could still go a little bit further actually, couldn't it? Just, just drop it down, say there. Let's have a look. And yeah, that, that looks really nice. That's a really nice looking bucket handle, if I do say so myself. 
OK, and that completes the bucket. That's as much as we really need to do in order to make this work. Before we start reaching for the dynamics tags, I'm just going to move my subdivision surface. Uh, in fact, what I'll do, I don't need to move the surface. I just need to move its axes. Just move those up. Change views. Just go to our side view. Just move that up to the middle of the handle there. And that should do fine. It doesn't really matter about the cube. That's OK because it's the subdivision surface that we're going to be working with. And we'll rename that handle, actually, and drop the bucket under the cube there and make it all one object. And then I can move that down to the bottom. OK, that's great. That's the first little bit of this done. Moving on from here, we'll start adding dynamics tags. So we'll come down to simulation tags and I'm going to put a collider body on the in fact, I'm going to put it on the hook rather than the hook assembly. Let's have a look and see what we need to change. Now, in the inherit tag, I'm going to simply say none, individual elements off. The shape I'm going to change from a static mesh to a moving mesh and leave everything else the same. It should be OK. With the handle, again, come down to simulation tags. I'm going to say rigid body this time. And in the inherit tag, compound collision shape, and I'll leave the individual elements set to all. The shape, again, a moving mesh. And I'm going to leave everything else the same. I will just check the use margin. I won't actually do anything in there. I'm just going to check the box. The final part of this is to go into the simulate menu, come down to dynamics and select spring. And I'm going to drop that between the hook assembly and the handle just in there. Its type is linear, so that's fine. The object A, I'm going to drag in the hook and the handle for the object B. At the moment, the spring is gigantic, so let's just change it to a five centimeter draw size. And then we can go back into the object and do a little bit more work. So instead of using center of mass, I'm going to say offset for both of the objects. And that places the spring where I want it. So it's connected to the top of the handle and, and the top of the hook. That's, I know it's a bit of a weird setup, but that's fine. That's exactly what it needs to be. And then the last stage of this is to set the rest length. And that should work OK. There may be some tweaks that we need to do, but we'll just see what happens when we run the timeline. And yet, yeah, that's looking pretty good. It's looking as if that's working OK. I'll just go in Command D and have a look, have a look at the dynamics. So I've got a collision margin. I'm in the Expert tab, which is where I need to be. In the collision margin, I've got one centimeter. That, that's all good. The scale is good. Um, steps for frame. That's Initially, it's five. Let's try five and see if this makes any difference. It might give us a bit more jitter. It's not too bad, though, is it? It looks OK, but there's a bit. It might be a bit of bit jittery. Let's put it back at 10. Well, that's not really much different. If anything, it's just slowed things down a little bit. Let's I'll put it at five for now. and We'll see what happens. But that's the actual dynamic stage set up for this. So the next thing we can do is look at doing a little bit of animation and actually operating our cylinder here to make the winch actually work. And we'll see what happens then. So that will be the next thing we're going to do. I'm just going to drop my cylinder into the winch there. And I'm also going to change it to or its name to capstan. That's what we'll call that now. This is the object that we're going to animate. So let's just have a quick look at where it is and make sure that everything's set up right. So we can leave that at six nine. See, I tell you what, six nine hundred. Let's just make that six nine hundred. Just run the timeline again. That that bucket drop. Actually, there's one thing that we can do. Thinking about it, if we will drop that bucket down there. If you look at it, there is a gap, isn't there, between the hook and the bucket. What we'll do is just set the dynamics for the handle. If I say set initial state, 
I should be able to go back to zero. That's fine. What I'll do in order to correct that problem with the, the hook, the easiest thing to do is just to select it, command drag and copy it. Take the dynamics tag off the hook that we've copied and make the dynamic hook invisible. And then simply move the hook up so that we're about there. And that should solve the problem for us. Yeah, I mean, that's much, much better. That sells, that sells things a lot better, doesn't it? So that's how to solve that little problem there. It's just the easiest thing to do is just sort of a bit of a cheat, really. But uh, an invisible dynamic object and a visible object that's just a dummy object, technically. And because they're both grouped into the hook assembly, the Expresso expression will take care of everything. There won't be any problems at all. Let's take a look then at animating the capstan. So in our rotation B, we're at zero on the timeline. We can just click on there. And if we move our timeline forward, and we'll give ourselves some more frames. So let's just increase this to 600. If we go to, say, 200 frames and we set our angle to zero and click, and then we'll, we'll allow a pause of, say, 100 frames and then click again, go to 500 frames and set our rotation B to minus 6,900 once again to bring things back to where they were and then click to record another keyframe. And that should be all we need to do. So let's go back to zero. And what we'll do is we just change our camera angle so that we're looking down on this. Just move it about somewhere there. Let's just see what happens and see if this bucket actually reacts the way we'd expect it to. Yeah. Looking good. I'll tell you what, let's just, <laughs> it goes so far down, I've got to just zoom out a little bit and move it back a little bit further. And then possibly do a bit more rotation on there so that we can really see what we're doing. Yeah, that's all looking very nice. Let's just, we'll let it do a complete cycle and just see what happens. But yeah, so far it's looking very, very nice. Yeah, I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. And we're coming back up. Yeah, the bucket's behaving itself fine. I mean, there's no jitter. It's not flying around everywhere. It's doing exactly what we'd like it to do. Yeah. But there's one thing, yeah. No, it's not. There's nothing. I thought there was something there. No, it's good. That's just, I mean, that bucket is really subtle, the way that it moves, but that's that's fine. You know, it just gives it that little extra bit of, a bit of sort of secondary animation it puts in there. I mean, you can just do the bucket and, and group it into the hook and not make it a dynamic object, but I just think making that dynamic, it just, that little bit of subtlety that comes into it, where you just see that subtle movement, it's a, it just brings it alive just a bit more. And it's it's a nice effect. So yeah, I mean that's 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 working absolutely great. Uh, I'm really happy with that. So yeah, I mean that's the dynamic stage of this all sorted out, and it's working very pleasantly indeed. So there's just a few more things I want to show you, and uh, just to finish this off, uh, because you know there there are a few sort of things that just need doing, and and, and uh, some nice little tweaks that you can do, uh, and things that you can enhance this with if you wanted to use it in a different situation and I'll show you those next. First thing I'm going to show you is how to change the rope into a steel cable and you can do that really easily if we just get a hold of a flower believe it or not a flower profile and we start doing a little bit of work with this what we can do straight away is put the inner radius we'll, we'll say 0.4 the outer radius 0.6 not 
So we've got a small flower there now. And what we'll do is go into the number of petals. That's what we wish to change. I'm going to change that to 12. And then this profile, what we can do is drop it. I'll just take this, this circle out. If we just drop that into the sweep. If we just zoom in, you can see that you're getting something that's almost cable like, but it's not quite because it needs a twist and we can do that in the sweep. So where we've got the end rotation, if we say what we can do is three six the formula is quite simple 360 and we multiply that by the number of coils so we'll say times 19 that has a rough number I mean I know it was quite a little, little bit shy it was of 19 but it doesn't matter that'll be fine so if we do that we've created the effect of, of having a steel cable there so if you wanted to use this as part of a crane say that would be great for that and if you put a metallic texture on it you know, it will look superb. And, in, and because it's totally procedural, you've got control over how many, you know, how much twist you want and and everything else. So it's it's looking really nice. If you wanted more cables in it, just add more petals to your flower. Fantastic. So that's the first little thing I wanted to show you there. It does actually slow down the animation, of course, because the computer's got to work a bit harder to display that. But as you can see, it works really, really beautifully. So we'll just put that back to zero. So that's the first little thing I wanted to show you there. Let's just take that flower back out and put the circle back in. And again, we'll take off the end rotation just to bring that back as it was. The next thing I'm going to show you involves working with the placement of the objects in the scene. Now, normally when you're working with global positions you can pick things up and you can move them anywhere well we've got a little bit of an issue as you can see here the hook because we're using the range mapper is a little bit as awry there it's, it's not doing what we want it to do so how do we fix this well it is perfectly simple actually so in the cable position here instead of using global position Z we can in fact use simply position Z so if you want to move it somewhere else in the scene, just put position Z in there. That's all you need to do. And then you'll find the whole rig for that moves perfectly well and it behaves itself and it will still work when you run the timeline. So that sorts that one out. Of course, if you want to move your dynamics with it, that's easy as well. All you can all you need to do in this situation is select everything from the winch to the bottom there and we can move them anywhere we like in the scene and when we run the timeline it all still works I mean ultimately if you're using dynamics you're probably going to want some motion blur on it so you're going to need to bake the dynamics anyway uh, and then you you know you're going to have to do a little bit of work there so you may even have to bring your your dynamics and drag them into the dope sheet and do a bit of extra work in there too but that's that's fine I mean for, for what we need here I mean for, for setting it up it, it will be fine I mean you, if you just want it over here or over here whatever for doing that initial setup it all works perfectly well so yeah that solves that problem and that's another little thing I've shown you the final thing to finish this off really is to just finish the build for the capstan I'm going to give it two more hike segments so we've got we've got four in there and I'll make it editable. I'll also switch off the sweep so that we can see what we're doing and we'll go into our top view and just select objects so that we can see exactly what we've got. In edge mode if I hit UL I can select the two inner edge loops and then I'll just simply push those out towards there so that they're just at the ends of the object go into my front view and select polygon mode and again UL select both the ends loops there if I can <laughs> no it's not getting a little bit closer that's better so I've got my two end loops and then all I need to say is D for extrude and I'll go to which is a bit much. Let's go 
that should be fine let's just bring the sweep back in yeah I mean that's going to be okay isn't it that's not too bad that looks quite nice there so the next thing to do is just check out in the top view whether we're in the correct position there I think we can probably yeah what I can probably do at the oh, it's all right I think at the right hand side is fine so if I do UL just select those and UL select not those those and those and again I can hold down command and UL to get rid of that that particular selection there all I've got to do is move these a little bit out a little bit further away I think in the Z so that they're not quite touching the end that should be fine so again I'm going to turn off my sweep go into my top view and select edges and UL once more and just get this middle loop here and then bring this to somewhere near the end and again let's have a look see where we are so we're, we're just on that part there let's just put the sweep back in and see what we've got here and we can see where that loop is and if I just push that back a little bit further that's fine and then once again in polygon mode I can get a hold of just this polygon and extrude that one out by one and a half centimeters too and that gives us the polygon that we can well it looks as if we've attached our cable to this particular part of the capstan and that will just help to sell things and then to finish the capstan off what I did with mine I simply held down my shift key and grabbed a hold of a bevel deformer and dropped that in and then I just did a bit of work in here I probably made that about 0.2 uh, and three subdivisions maybe even 0.1 would be fine yeah that's more subtle and that's as much as I did and that finishes the capstan off and I think that's quite pleasant on the eye but of course you can build this however you like it's it's entirely up to you you're the art director really but that just about finishes this off so let's just run the timeline once more and yeah it all looks good it all looks really quite nice and that about completes this tutorial so once again I hope this has been of value to you it's been quite a long one this one but hopefully the journey has been worth taking and if you have enjoyed the video then please give it a thumbs up and please share it with your friends and of course if you haven't already subscribed to the channel then please do so because all this good stuff helps to keep it going in the right direction but anyway that about wraps it up for now so I'll see you very shortly on the next tutorial